Good morning. We are live again on YouTube. Good yes. morning, everyone. Happy Sunday, Gordana. How are you? It's not morning for you, I realize, but morning. Yeah, still. it's afternoon for me, but good morning, <laughs> yeah. good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Right. Oh my God, this is, this is going to be a beautiful Sunday live because we are going to continue to talk about ego and the two yes. sides of ego. Yes. And um, we're going to explore um, how we are taught to misuse our ego and it's done in the childhood so we have to go back in time and look at where did we learn to put on the negative ego mask because mm -hmm. it is a form of protection which is illusionary from beginning but if we have parents that do not understand who they are then they will inflict negative ego masks upon us yes. upon us us yes. <laughs> i can't even speak today so this is what we are going to explore today and i'm so excited about same. this same yeah. and you know we were talking earlier this week and i had the story of yeah i you know every it seems like every week every day i'm having a parenting lesson <laughs> that applies to my childhood yes. and breaking yes. this um <clears throat> breaking even more the cycle, you know, you know, you helped me with my Ted talk, breaking mm -hmm. the cycle of child abuse. So mm -hmm. everything that I look at that passes from me to my children or from mm -hmm. me to my wife, mm -hmm. I'm checking, is this passed from, or is this originate from me? Is this from something else or am I the originator? Yes. And everything that I do, I want it to be a clean, I am the source of it. There's no generational trauma. Mm -hmm. So I think last Sunday I talked about my son saying, why, you know, in front of everyone and, and my neighbor is like, oh, buddy, we don't say why, <laughs> you know, and he's a funny, <laughs> funny guy. Well, this week um, I had this other experience where mm -hmm. my son, um, we turned the, the TV off, we turned the devices off and there was a little fit thrown. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because I was talking to them. I had a big, we had this huge blow up and then I said, all right, we're all going to talk. Everyone come together. And, and we had this beautiful reconciliation mm -hmm. and my Lauren was like, you know, thank you for doing that because I would have just said, go to bed and, you know, left it. And I was like, you know, that's, we can't do that. We have to reconcile, you know, and yes. there's, there's a verse in the Bible that says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And it's such a beautiful concept of like, regardless of what, mm -hmm. reconcile and, and yes. go to bed in love and sleep in love. So we're talking about two sides of ego this morning. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm reconciling with them and the, the issue was they were just talking back and we're trying to teach and Colin said, well, what is talking back? I'm like, it's a great question. And and we're like, how do we explain this? I said, we want you to ask questions. You can ask questions, but you, but we don't want you to fuss about it. We want you to say, okay, I understand. And why, or can I do this later? Or I said, use your words, but don't just throw a fit. And he goes, well, why is a question? And I was like, good point. <laughs> like if we say yes. time turn off, why? Yes. And so, and that's a long story. I'll, I'll try to wrap it. What, while we were reconciling, we had this beautiful family meeting and everyone was together. Mm -hmm. I started staring at the wall and, and on all walls here, I don't know what it's like in Sweden and imagine it's the same, but we have this texture mm -hmm. over the wall. And I said, and it just came to mind. I said, when I was a kid, I used to stare at the wall and look for figures, kind of like staring at the clouds. I would stare at the wall and my wife goes, when did you do that? And I said, well, I used to have to stand in the corner all the time. Mm -hmm. They'd put my nose in the corner. Even if people were there, I'd stand there. If we had company over, they, I would have to stand in the corner, put my nose in the corner. And it was like a public way of shaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about both sides of ego. So mm -hmm. I'm sharing with the kids <laughs> and they're like, you had to do what? And I was like, oh yeah, I guess that's pretty great. <laughs> crazy to look at these things and and find the animals or find the patterns but I had spent so much time <laughs> staring mm -hmm. at a wall and I'm bringing this story up because 
it's the two sides. We're talking about the two sides of ego. Mm-hmm. So I could look at that and, and recall like how I hated mm-hmm. to be in that corner, how I hated that. And I did, but I also found the beauty yes. in these little texturized yes. things. And yes. I recalled this to my family and it reconciled all of us in that mm-hmm. I'm not repeating those patterns they understand that me even talking with them is a new Mm. exploration of how a healthy family dynamic gets to be. Um, And I realized that I could be, that could be a trauma thing still to this day, but I choose, I chose to find the beauty in it. And I think Mm -hmm. to wrap this up is that ego when it's in wound, when it's in pain, when it's in fear, when it's in scarcity, when it's in lack, mm-hmm. will project mm-hmm. a reality that is painful. But when it's in love mm-hmm. or some sort of self-discovery, you can yes. find the beauty in this. And that's how mm-hmm. I'm teaching my children. That's how I'm choosing to look through this lens yes. today. Yes, absolutely. What you're talking about is what I would call trauma intelligence. Hmm. because you go back and you look at this and you say, okay, so I see the choice here. I could either see it as total guilt tripping, shaming, horrible experience, or you can see the power that you had. You had a corner to look in Mm -hmm. and you could, you could look and you can see figures and stuff. They can't They can't penetrate your mind. You're always free in your mind. And it's it's connected to three things. It's connected to agency, autonomy, and authority. Mm. Agency being the sense of power because they can't break your, your imagination. They can't take that away from you. So that's agency then, or yeah agency and the power to do so then you have autonomy they can tell you to stand in the corner but you're still free in your mind because you're looking at clouds you're looking at formations you're looking at uh, at figures which is your imagination they cannot penetrate that Mm -hmm. and authority well they can tell you to stand in the corner and you will stand in the corner but your mind is not there your mind is doing something else so you're actually you can see the two sides if you if you allow their version of you and mm-hmm. reality to become your reality by reacting to it, yes. you will lose the three A's. You yes. will lose the agency, the autonomy, and the authority being you in your life. Mm-hmm. So I love the story because it shows you how you can look at it. And it is a horrific thing. I, I mean, I cannot understand a, a human being who would tell their child to do so, such a thing and think that it will make any positive difference in their life but at the same time if you know how to deal with it because you're connected to your higher self as you did as a child Mm -hmm. you come out of it with trauma intelligence not just trauma because you will know you will recognize pain in another child you will recognize how to where it's where compassion is needed you will recognize where empathy is needed because you know how it feels you wouldn't Mm -hmm. sit by if a parent would tell their child stand in the corner you would say hey wait a minute don't do that Mm. that's trauma intelligence that is trauma transformed into trauma intelligence Mm. i love the story it's such a beautiful story also do you see what happens when you bring love or rather understanding in a situation which is um, which is aggressive from beginning, when you when you bring something else, there's a beautiful quote by Nietzsche, and he says, "Beware that when fight, fighting monsters, you yourself do not become a monster." Mm. So what you did, you didn't become the monster. You actually became something else so that your children can see how can I transform something that is really stressful into something that actually makes me feel good afterwards. Mm. Yeah. So it's such yeah. a beautiful story. And you stopped yourself from inflicting a trauma, yeah. um, a trauma frequency in your children. Right. That's how you break that. That's also how you show them that you can you can use the ego in the right way 
right. it's not forbidden to say why. It's a question of where does the why originate? Right. <laughs> right. right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly that's right. what it is. I mean, yes. I love the story. It's such a beautiful story. And I, I continue to say this, our children are our best teachers. Yes, yes, yes. They've always been that. For me, it's the same thing with my son all the time. And as I say, he's 24 and I still mm. learn new things about myself with him mm. still. So it's never going to end. In a way, that's the relationship. It, it, it will always be teacher, student, him being the teacher and me being the student. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, what's so beautiful about this and, and everyone watching, thank you for joining today and, and me hearing the story that I start off with is that we're talking still about choice and the two sides of ego and, and even in the most intense moments, if we forget that there's always a choice, we will default in one side of the ego. There is the, the fear-based scarcity death is really what's impending. Like it just closes the aperture of that camera where it allows no light and we can't mm-hmm. see. But if we pause mm. and just for a moment think what other option is there, it opens back up the aperture, allows light in, and we can mm-hmm. see so much more clearly mm-hmm. where we don't feel shame, regret, disappointment yeah. in ourselves. Yeah. And I think so many people are carrying this every single day. I was talking to my wife about some men that have come to the men's retreats that I've done. And I thought, God, if they never had had someone hold space for them, that amount of shame. And even though they never would admit it on the surface was killing them. And I think about humanity as a whole, like we have to come to this time of option of clarity of pause and choosing a different way than just being Mm -hmm. stuck in this prison of the fear-based ego yeah because it doesn't give you any choice that right. is a prison that's a box you yes. you're put into yes you know i've always wondered why uh, every religion talks about sacrifice and it's become a crazy thing the sacrificing um i think that it's a question of sacrificing the negative side of the ego that is what needs to be sacrificed in every now moment it feels like a sacrifice in that moment because you can't win an argument. You can't win, 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 win. Mm. So you have to step back and allow other frequencies to come in. And the sacrifice is the negative side of the ego. As soon as you sacrifice the negative side of the ego, meaning the the urge to win, the urge to be right, the urge to whatever it is to control other people, as soon as you realize that you don't have to do it, that's the sacrifice you're making and it feels good, but it doesn't feel good in that moment when you're making it. So you literally have to be connected to your higher self, literally want to ask yourself, where does this originate? Is it originating in my mind and my will to argument about this, my will to win this argument, to be right, or does it come from true understanding? What is it that I want with this? What's my intention with the communication with my children, for instance? Mm, Do I want to teach them something? Do I want to control them? Negative side of the ego. But if you want to help them understand something, that's a different place. It comes from a different, and you can feel it in your body. Yes. So the trick here, and you know that because you just did it with your children, The trick is to stay calm, Mm -hmm. to breathe, and then to ask the question, what is my goal here? And then allow that to come from the positive side of ego, because that is where your goals are. You need to find your goal. If your goal is to win over your own children, it's the negative side of the ego. That's it. Gloria or Gloriana asked, you just answered her question. She said, Uh, when we realize we are currently, uh, when we realize what we are currently going through a traumatic event or feeling, do you recommend to cut it right away or should we feel it and then act? What's a normal time frame? And I think you just answered is mm-hmm. we take that pause. We take a breath and the imprint, we have to ask ourselves as humans, where is our instinct? Mm-hmm. Where does that instinctual 
reaction, where does that come from? No baby instinctually is taught. That's not an innate, like impose a force or will. Mm -hmm. We come into the world receiving everything, Mm -hmm. not enforcing everything. Mm -hmm. So then when we react Mm -hmm. in a way that forces another to submit, Mm -hmm. that is from previous hell trauma. Yes. And what I have found is that in me, I still feel the imprint. I know exactly the, the violence, the anger, the terror that would happen to me when observing my son, he does something. So what's interesting, and I've shared this, I think before, and I am aware that I have this imprint and the imprint is tied to my inner child who is a trying to connect to this father figure, trying to relate to like, what if I do this, if I feel what he feels, maybe I will understand him more. So children are constantly trying to understand, to connect to this godlike figure in their home life that mm-hmm. represents this all-knowing, all-powerful, flawless being. Flawless yes. being. Yes, yes. I'm yes. going to say unconditional love, but that's not the case. But mm-hmm. I mean, the, the imprint of the child is trying to connect. Mm-hmm. So we carry this imprint. And then... We have to pause and choose in me. Am I going to allow the imprint to continue or am I going to parent myself by parenting my child in the way that my child, apart from that imprint, wanted Mm. to be talked to, spoken with, held, Mm. not hit. Yes, you have the imprint in order to connect to your child. Yes. That's that's the reason it's there. I mean, it mm-hmm. isn't fair because you had to go through hell as a child. Yeah. But it's still there for a reason. And if you don't recognize the reason, you will act upon an old frequency which is not your frequency. It is your father's frequency creating a reality which is more his reality than your reality. Right. And giving it to your child too so it's a question of reaction or action giving yourself the time Mm. not to react to that urge within you if the urge comes from the wrong place in yourself Mm. for me it was like you know the course that we are doing and i share pictures of me where i'm sitting like this because i do not have a voice whatever i said my father would annihilate He wouldn't listen. He ignored everything I said. Mm -hmm. And I remember not being heard. So what kind of imprint did that make on me? Well, I just absorbed everything. I held everything. As a girl, I wasn't supposed to be angry. I wasn't supposed to react to things. So what I did was that I held this anger. Mm -hmm. And I held this anger all the time time so when my brothers who were younger than me came home and they told me there's guys out there they're bullying us or they're 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 beating us up i wouldn't have the time to put my shoes on i would Mm -hmm. run barefoot outside and then i just asked them who is it and they pointed (laughs) and i could run hit and then run back that's how Mm -hmm. much anger i had because i thought it doesn't matter i can't speak to those children because my i have no voice they don't listen That's the imprint. Even if you have a voice, Mm -hmm. you know that they don't listen. No one will hear you because your father, the godlike figure, the authority in your reality does not hear you. You you do not exist unless you're a tool in his world. So that's one of those things. Like anger is, uh, that is a trigger for the negative side of the ego. Mm. It becomes a trigger for the negative side. I mean, I'm not a violent person. It's not in my personality to hit someone. But as a child, it became my way of communicating because my negative side of my ego was awakened by not being heard as a child. Mm. So that's one of the things. The other thing is ignorance. When someone ignores you, to me, it was like, are you questioning my intelligence? And that could become a thing going on within me and I would become reactionary. Every time you react to someone else's frequency, you start creating their version of reality. 
Yes. Which means that yes. that is that is what the negative side of ego will do to you. It will mm. push you in a direction which is creating a reality that isn't connected to who you are because it, it's not your goal. Mm. It becomes a reaction. So becoming aware is is this a reaction or am I actually thinking about an action that is more aligned with who I am? And that is what happens when you stand in that place where you recognize the frequency going on within you, telling you that, oh, oh, this is mm. not good. Mm. That is when you're putting the negative ego mask on. And there is a, a time frame mm. while you're putting it on. That is the time frame you have to recognize where does this come from? Is it a me problem or a he, she problem? Yeah. Yeah. I usually you can find a lot of solutions within yourself so that you won't react because the only one that wins when you react to something are the ones triggering you. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, anger and ignorance are like portals to this negative side of the ego. There are many, many other things like for instance, let's say competition. Mm. When I was a child, my father used to um, compare me to other people on the outside. He would say, why can't you be like this girl? Why can't you be like this boy? Mm. Which of course creates an imprint in me where I start thinking, no matter what I do, I will never be good enough. Mm -hmm. That's the, a negative ego mask. So whenever I look at someone, I will interpret as they are much better than me. That's a default thing, which takes time to realize that that is not the truth. That's a mask. That is a mask my ego, the negative side of my ego will use in order to keep me in victimhood. Mm. So, or for instance, doing it with my brothers, telling my brothers, for instance, why can't you be like your sister? Because I was good in school. My, one of my, the middle brother was not. He was a genius when it came to sports, but he didn't like school. And he used to put us against each other and tell my brother, why can't you be like your sister? What we did, and this is really intelligent because children can't do this usually, but we made a pact. I told him, no matter what he says, you are good enough as you are. And he said the same thing to me. And never, ever has my father been able to split us with this because we had a pact. And we were small children when we did this because I didn't like to see him cry and be, he was the only one I had and I was the only one he had. So we had, it, it was a survival mechanism within us. But most children can't do that. So they grow up hating their their relatives, their, their brothers and sisters, yeah. because their parents didn't have intelligence enough or knowing themselves enough in order not to inflict these kind of ego triggers upon them. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what was the case with my brother and I. We were raised yeah. as enemy competitors. Yes, but then always divide and conquer, you know, that's 100%. the thing. Yeah. 100%. And then we were made to feel guilty when we weren't like close why aren't you, you know, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it was so crazy. I had this thought yesterday and, and why I'm sharing some of these like past stuff. I want people to understand Me that too. they're not alone when yes. they go through their own things. But yesterday I have no idea what tr triggered this. And I was thinking last night, like what made me think of that? But this came to my mind when I was a, growing up, my dad would tell me all the time, I brought you into this world and I will mm -hmm. take you out of this world. And I was always afraid he was going to kill me to literally, even when I gave the Ted talk, I was afraid he was mm -hmm. going to kill me. You know, this. Yes, I know. I know. And people don't understand this because he was so charming and people to this day, like, Oh, you know, but behind the mask. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what kind of trauma did that create in me? Always believing that this monster person would kill me. Mm -hmm no matter where you are exactly yeah. i would hear i can't even tell you how many times i've heard that i brought you into this world i can take you out of this world and mm -hmm. and really believing it like i was really afraid that he would kill me <laughs> mm -hmm. and i'm looking at my own children like what 
what insanity to even utter those words, to make a child think that the end of their life, I, I never want my children to think the end of their life is imminent at any moment, like live long and prosper and be blessed yes. for many generations. And I hope forever you are like thriving and abundant. And yet that is from what I'm able to create, but I can't believe that that is, it's so utterly insane. And I know I'm not the only one who's heard that terminology, but I, I think if there's a takeaway today that people also give themselves grace, like mm -hmm. if you're not happy and you're stuck in this ego mask and you're stuck in this fear and scarcity, there's a reason. And the reason comes from childhood imprints. And yes. when we can learn to forgive ourselves and go back and heal our inner child and, you know, like the course we're coming out with, like help mm -hmm. us really hold space for the innocence that we once were. If we can, when we connect to that innocence, it, gives us a framework and a baseline to pause and say, mm -hmm. wait, would I do this to myself? Would I do this to an, that's why I start my Ted talk. Have you ever seen someone do this to a puppy? And I start, take a belt and I start beating my hand. I'm like, no, that'd be insane. Nope. Who would do that? But people do it to children every single day. And we're like, wow, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a question of the authority. Um, that he had over you, even though he wasn't in the same room as you were. Yeah. Because he, he put this imprint of, you cannot relax, I will always find you. So yes. here, the, the, the portal to the negative side of your ego is fear. Always, yeah, always. Always. I mean, for me, it was like, if you don't do what I tell you to do, then I'll cut you off. You won't be able to come home. I'll change the locks so you'll be outside. I mean, if you're 14 years old, that's existential. It's like killing someone, telling them that you won't have a home. You'll have to be homeless in a country where there are no homeless people. Mm. So of course you start finding ways of how to do what they want you to do. Put yourself second. That's the real imprint. Put yourself second and you become a people pleaser instead because you're managing the fear of being left out, managing the fear of being yes. homeless, managing the fear of not connect to other people because you have a parent that tell you this. Right. Another thing is, you know, ri ridicule. Hmm. When you come with dreams, for me, it was like I wanted to study and where my father came from, women do not study. They get married and they have children studying. Why would you, you have no brain. That was his answer always. So when I said, well, you know what I want to, he would say, who do you think you are? Mm. Who do you think you are? And I'm thinking, how can I answer that question? Because he would laugh, whatever I said, he would laugh at this. So what does that create in a person? Well, it creates an insecurity. Yeah. And you walk through life thinking, who do I think I am? So you don't dare to dream. Mm. It robs you of your dreams. This is also, again, it creates a negative ego, which will keep you in victimhood because you don't dare to dream. Mm. Mm. So there are so many different portals for the negative ego mask to be put on your face. And the earlier it happens, the more rooted it becomes. Yeah. Yeah. The illusion becomes more real. Yeah. And you can't tell the difference from reality and the illusion. And what you and I are doing here, we're actually trying to um, share a way to recognize when the negative ego is active yes. and it's easy that is easy what is hard is to stop it to become aware of it and then stop it and turn it around right. that might take a little bit of practice because we've practiced putting on the negative side of ego yeah. all the time so it's like second nature to us right. but becoming aware of the subtle energies going on in the moment you can't practice it unless there is a moment which triggers it. With you, it would be your children because you have four of them now. So yeah. <laughs> bless you, you will have many opportunities. Right. You are That's blessed right. with beautiful children that will trigger you. Yes. For others, it might be at work, mm -hmm. talking to your parents, talking to your siblings, talking to your husband or wife, 
All of these things, when you feel triggered, this is an opportunity to practice. Where does this, this originate and how can I change it? How can I give myself an option here? What is the option here? Not a habitual answer, which will almost always be the negative ego yeah. answering because you've tried to survive your entire life. It's a survival mechanism. The negative ego is connected to the survival in this world. Mm. Whereas your positive ego is connected to thriving and reinforcing your personality and identity here. Mm looking allowing god to look through your eyes yes. looking for the things that god wants to explore in this reality yes. not that things that your negative ego will tell you are true right for me god you know what that it's yeah. like source yes. source yes. looking through my eyes wanting to explore something specific which is connected to my goals and dreams and desires yes and as soon as i do not see the option there for me my goal with my communication with my son is clarity mm. and my negative side of ego will always put murkiness in it so i know when it's murky i know that i am operating from negative ego mm. So it's a question of understanding, f feeling the, the, the frequency going on, yeah. interpreting it right, and then choosing something else. Yeah. I think if for everyone watching live right now or later, one of the most powerful exercises you could do just to give yourself a framework, a baseline to pause is to write down to get very clear and breathe and, and be still and write down how you wished you were parented. Like just a recall, like I think we, we were so caught up in present moment and future, but to go back just for a moment and to say, when something happened, whatever the scenario, I wished I was whatever you want. I wished I was sat down with versus screamed at. I wish I was held versus hit. I wish I was seen, seen versus mm -hmm. dismissed. I wish I, yes. whatever those, those scenarios are heard. Yeah. Because we are craving to be seen, known and heard, yes. heard and affirmed. Yes. And if we can't go back and give ourselves a baseline, then we'll never be satisfied going out into the world. It's never going to be enough. You can't work enough hours. You can't make enough money. You can't be pleased enough people. It's just never enough. And it's exhausting mm -hmm. till we go back and like, Hmm. And it's interesting. Even last night, Cameron, our oldest was saying, she, <laughs> she goes, yeah, I'm not perfect um, to Claire. And she's like, but Claire, our youngest, or no, mm -hmm. not youngest anymore. <laughs> daughter was saying, but you are perfect. Dad says we are perfect. And I hear overheard. I said, yes, you are perfectly who you are. And it's beautiful. And no one ever is a hundred percent in action perfect but we all learn and i was thought that's interesting this five-year-old hearing mm -hmm. from a 10-year-old like yes. saying well i'm not perfect i make mistakes and then our youngest saying dad says we are perfect <laughs> and i over here like no you are perfect the way you are yes yes but you don't have to yeah. hold that pressure of being perfect in action we're all learning absolutely staying in this place where you are learning being open to it another thing is making mistakes how many of you were allowed to make mistakes? I do not remember a time where I was allowed to make a mistake. I had to, I had to get it perfect the first time I did it. So what does that do to you? Well, it makes you an overthinker mm. or it makes you hesitate or it makes you never taking a step in a direction which you want to take. It stagnates you. And that's where the negative side of ego will keep you because it's a prison. If you take a step, no back. Try this, no back. Because what if it's a mistake? What if I'm not perfect? What if, what if, what if? Well, so what, so what, so what? No one cares. It's a question of understanding that we are perfect, perfectly imperfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is what we are here. We are perfectly imperfect every single one of us if we were perfect we would be robots and we're not right. so there has to be a buffered zone where we can explore imperfection in order to find something that we think is perfection 
for me, you asked a question, what would you have wanted? Well, I would have wanted space mm. to make mistakes, space to explore, space to see who am I here? Mm. Instead of always knowing exactly what was wanted from me mm. and playing that role, which is not me. It's not even close to my authentic self. Hiding my authentic self within me deep, 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 and then creating all these masks of playing a role that is always in relationship to who I'm speaking to. Mm. And I also understand that unless I would have gone through all of these things, allowing my negative ego to keep me in this victimhood and then freeing myself from it, I wouldn't be able to write the book. Yeah. That's right. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing today, being right. fully, utterly authentic the way I am, not knowing how to turn it off anymore, because I know how it feels to not be there. Yeah. It's yeah. a, you're grieving all the time. There is a big sorrow going on where the authentic self is actually sitting in the shadow and crying all the time. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And Understanding where this frequency comes from, as I said before, understanding what is it that I'm exploring here? Is it some past wound that has come up and opened up my negative side or putting the negative mask on the filters and I'm seeing everybody as trying to win over me or, or mm -hmm. competing with me or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. If you can pull back, take a deep breath in, and then ask yourself, what would I want it to be instead? And give that, no matter what the response on the outside, giving right. that back. Yes. It's so interesting. You wanted space. I'm thinking like what, it made me really good at hiding, mm -hmm. cheating, and being a scam artist because I didn't want to get caught because getting caught was the worst. Yes. And and I look back and this is why courage is such a big thing for me now to stand there and like mm -hmm. hold space for hold others. Yes. Space because yes. I will not do that anymore and hide. And I lost a friendship. I don't know if I've ever showed, shared this with you, but so I attempted suicide at 20 years old. At 19 years old, I let a buddy drive uh, my car and he was driving me through this old neighborhood that he used to live in. And literally no it was kind of fun summer night and he was driving we weren't drinking no drugs no nothing we're just driving he was driving my car and a guy hit hit my car at a stoplight and then drove off and so i'm like following this guy and trying to get him to pull over and he speeds speeds away so we chase him and i call the cop i call 911 or call the police and they say who's driving and he's like so you're driving so you're driving oh, and i'm like have yeah, I told you yeah, this story? Yeah, yeah it I'm doesn't like, matter. Go ahead. I, I'm driving. I'm like, I'm driving, blah, blah, blah. So when the police come and they finally catch this guy and we write a police report out and he was high on some crazy drug, I wrote down that I was driving. Everything mm -hmm. else was true. Everything else was 100% accurate. I mean, there was damage to my car. It wasn't like we made mm -hmm. this up, except one thing. You well, yeah. when my, when I attempted suicide, everything changed. I forgot. I mean, almost like two different lives I lived. It was like pre and post to suicide attempt. And, um, I hung out with different people. I stopped hanging out actually with people all together. And I started reading and became a little bit of a recluse. And a year later, I get subpoenaed to be a witness in trial against this guy. And my first thing was, I need to tell the truth. I have to tell mm -hmm. the truth. I can't lie anymore. I'm so tired. I can't hide. I can't continue this. So I called the process, the DA, the <laughs> prosecuting attorney. And I said, Hey, I, this is going to sound really weird, but I need to tell you that I wasn't driving that night. Everything else is accurate. And then that caused, well, were you on drugs? Why, why, why did you lie? All this stuff. And I said, I can't, I don't have a good answer. I just want you to know everything's accurate, except I wasn't driving. My buddy's driving. And I told my buddy that because he got subpoenaed too. I told my buddy that I told him the truth and he, it, it, we've never been friends since because he wanted me to continue with that story. And we both get brought into court. We're both sitting outside the courtroom and only one of us gets called onto the stand. And that was me. Mm 
Mm. And they had the bailiff right there. And the judge looks me in the eye and says, everything that you say right now will be held against you in this court of law. Did you lie on the police report and commit a crime? And I'm like, wow, I might get arrested right now. And I'm like, yes, I did. And the judge looks over at the prosecuting attorney and she has, he says, what do you want to do? And she's like, I've never experienced this. I don't really know, but we're not going to press charges. And they let me go. Mm-hmm. I told the truth in court, like the, like in the grand court of God's authority. Law, authority. Yes. I'm like, yes. I yes. told the truth. I came mm-hmm. clean. Mm-hmm. And forever since that time, I have never once back down from always telling the truth. But my whole life prior to that was doing anything but tell the truth. It was hiding. I got, I cheated, stole whatever I could do just to not get caught. Yeah. That is why courage is so important to me now mm-hmm. and to help people find the courage to stand for them, regardless of if people leave you because they like your wounded mask, if mm-hmm. you're isolated, to stand in your own integrity, to stand in your own power, literally will change everything, mm-hmm. everything. Absolutely. I mean, what you did was you transformed a very, very deep um, trauma into trauma intelligence. Mm. And this is why it never came back again. Right. Because it was solved. It was solved on the highest level possible. You were aware that you might be arrested and yet you held that space for yourself to show courage and it was recognized. What the universe told you is not the whole, Mm. the whole world is not like your father Mm. or the only authority that you knew as a child. So sometimes you actually need to go through that portal of fear Mm. in order to find yourself on the other side and say, okay, I understand that the universe is different than I thought it was. Mm, And then to shift it. This is so wearing that mask again, telling the truth shifts to a positive ego mask because you become more authentic, closer to your true personality. Your personality is not of a liar and a thief. No. Your personality is of someone who protects other people, of someone who tells the truth, of someone who is loving and caring and unconditionally present with the loved ones. Right. That was not your identity. So of course the universe will give you a perfect Mm. scenario where you can act that out and see which of these two will give me a better life Mm. even though you didn't recognize it at that time neither did i when i was younger this is my negative ego mask and this is my positive ego mask but it's a question of understanding the frequency on a deep 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 level Mm. not going against it when you know that okay this is a principle i need to follow it if i go astray i will not be aligned Mm. and you have you weren't aligned because someone disaligned you like the ones that trigger your negative ego mask are the ones that will pull you Mm. out of alignment right it's your job to put yourself back in alignment as Mm. a grown-up and you do it in the most scary moments of your life that's how you lose the negative stuff as i say we can't lose the negative side of the ego but we can learn how to use it and control it and i don't like the word control because I don't think anything needs to be controlled. It's more of pet relationship to them. Yeah. Looking at the negative side of ego as, as, a, as a pet you have to train so that it will do what you want it to do, not what it wants to do all the time. Pee mm. on the floor. No, right. that's not a good <laughs> thing. <right. laughs> uh, listen to this. So Gloriana says mm. something really fascinating. I would mm. love to to talk more with her about this. She says, in my case, it feels so ironic because I get very frustrated because the one who puts all the pressure on me is myself. I never had that problem with my parents. It hurts to realize I am my own bully. Well, that's interesting. I think that this is the negative ego mask speaking to her, telling her that no one else did this. You did this to yourself. So you can't find ease on the outside. (laughs) So good. It gives me chills. Yes. But I don't think so. Maybe your parents didn't do it, but 
someone who you saw as an authority. That could be a friend, that could be a teacher, that could be a bully in school. That A religious leader. Yes, yes. That made you feel like you're not good enough. You have to work harder in order to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Society can do that to a woman yeah. because it's not it's not tuned into um, the feminine side of us in, in, in the right way. Yeah, and you know what, what her parents to say what you're to affirm, it's not that they bullied her, but she didn't get the affirmation enough. Mm -hmm. So the imprint, it's not, and this is why I help people trauma. Sometimes it's not imposed trauma. Mm -hmm. It's withheld affirmation, yes. it's withheld love. Yes. So there's a void of like, I'm not, and I talk mm -hmm. to guys a lot because mm -hmm. obviously I experience sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional, mm -hmm. all these things. But some guys I work with, they're like, well, I didn't have anything. I'm like, well, what, what's going on? Well, like, well, did you get the love yes. that you wanted? Yes or no? Yeah. But my parents, are parents, that's not mm -hmm. what I'm asking you. Stop defending them. Yes. They're not on trial yes. here. You are trying to free your own trauma. Mm -hmm. Did you get loved the way your soul craved love? Yes or no? No? Because, you know, parents not, are not always aware of what they're imprinting their children with. They might be kind and loving, but yet something isn't okay because they carry stuff from their own childhood. Yeah. For instance, if you have a parent who is holding a grudge and you are the one saying, I'm so sorry, but they will not accept your apology. They won't mm. accept your love. They ignore your presence. That's a silent way of making you feel like you will never be good enough and I will never love you enough if you don't do as I want you to do, even though they never express it in words. Mm. So having a parent who does that might make you feel like, okay, I need to do better. I need to be better. And that becomes your own mantra afterwards because as if you start as a baby before you can speak, it will be a mantra you swim in without knowing where it came from. And I'm not saying that Gloriana, your parents are horrible people, absolutely not. They might be loving and present, but there might be something where they were giving you what they needed as children, but you maybe not needed that thing. I was doing that to my own son. I was trying to protect him because that was what I needed. I needed protection. He was born into a family that loves him unconditionally. He doesn't need protection. He needs space. And I didn't know how to give him that in the beginning. And I'm a loving parent, by the way. So your parents are probably loving parents, but there is something in the relationship that has made you feel like you are not good enough. And as I said in the beginning, it might not be them. It might be someone else that did this to you. Yeah. Interesting. You said you wished you would have had space. And then you're saying that your son didn't have enough space because yes. you, you know, I, like you were trying yeah, to fill the space of what yes. you needed. This is how it's so, I love talking about this stuff because <laughs> yes. it is, it's so deep. It is to talk mm -hmm. about quantum healing. Like we, yes. this is, if you look here, it's there. And if you look there, it's there and it's there at the same time. Yes. That's what I mean. There's like these imprints of connection, mm -hmm all these things. So you're, this is really, that is, I'm gonna have to think about that later because it's the mm -hmm. same thing for me. I'm trying to calibrate. Well, I want my children to be strong, articulate, use their voice, not be afraid to stand up for themselves, stand always up for themselves, mm -hmm. but, and not, but, and I'm like, well, what's the line? I don't want to tell my son, tough it out, like, chum it out, chum it out, chum it out. Mm -hmm. Like, well, Yes, I want him to be tough, but I think he's naturally tough. I think we're naturally tough. If we don't get that beat out of us, then we're naturally have grit. We're naturally coming in balance. So then I'm like, well, what you, you see, like, it's so fascinating. And I'm having a question now, am I going too far one way or not? And, and even that's ego, because when I come back to my source and say, how would I want to be loved? How do they need to be loved? It always mm -hmm. comes back to that present. And while you're talking, I see this image in front of me where everything is moving, yes. everything that has to do with this physical world, all the relationships that we have and the, how we treat each other and how we treat, treat ourselves, it's always moving because mm. 
the the physical world is movement energy in motion moving the only thing that is still is the observer from within so the observer is looking at the movement and wherever you look you will see what it is that you're looking for so uh, you're describing it oh it's there and it's there it's quantum physics exactly so where do we go to find the truth and the stillness that we need away from the movement well we go into this observer place and this is what we're talking about in every now moment this observer is present it is there so when you go back into it and you say to yourself is this me or them mm. where does this come from you're automatically in the observer position because mm. you're asking questions about the movement which means that you're not part of it you're the one observing it. So going inward and just feeling, okay, I need a few seconds here to regroup. Where does this come from? What am I adding to this? Is this coming from the right space within me? Does it resonate with me? If not, take a pause. We are, we are conditioned by our society, school, workplace, that everything needs to happen like this. It has to happen fast. You have, you have to answer everything as if our life depended on it. Are you catching a train or what? You don't have to do things that fast. You can say, I'm sorry, but I need some time to think about this. I need to figure out my answer. So I'll come back to you. With your children, with everyone, you can do this because there is no rush. That is something that is illusionary. That is something that we are taught you have to answer immediately. Why? Again, I sound like your son. Why? <laughs> no, it's, great. it's great. One thing that I've noticed about immediacy is society has propped up the fast talkers. Mm -hmm. If you can talk really fast, but a little, you know, just spit out words. People, have, society or the media has propped those up as intelligent. But like, if you look at Osho or some mm -hmm. of these older, you know, sages, they speak yes. so slow Whoa. yes and probably right there is like the immediacy is such a lie to feel like and, and people feel so insecure like i don't speak well why because you don't speak fast mm -hmm. maybe you speak maybe what you say is what's mm -hmm. needed in the fast talking and it's not to indict fast talking people but i'm just saying mm -hmm. that that is such a i know my brother for instance he's he's analytical He's an analyzer. He speaks a lot more slowly. He mm -hmm. had a speech impediment when he was young. So he's, he's slow. He's been slower in his delivery. I was always mm -hmm. faster because I'm trying to like out, mm -hmm. outdo it all. Like, mm -hmm. And I realized when I slowed in, it's more impactful. When those who are slow honor their mm -hmm. speed at whatever cadence, mm -hmm. it's more impactful. I think even you've mentioned like, you know, English is not your first language. And, nope. and yet, so the delivery, it's, it's, and it lands more mm -hmm. when it's delivered from that mm. conscious space versus just. Mm. Just uh, talking like, yeah, a, just, like a machine gun or something. Yeah, like I was going to say, like a machine gun. Like, yeah. Just like, <laughs> words out there. <laughs> well, absolutely. I, I'm always talking about giving yourself time and it sounds like you need, you know, five minutes or whatever, but you don't. All you need to do is take a deep breath or just pause or not say anything. Silence to rethink it. For me, it's like I, I had a conversation with my husband the other day and he was at the gym with my son and I don't know, something happened there and they were both triggered by something I don't, I don't know the, what the conversation was about. But what I really loved was when my husband came home and he said, you know what? My son is my greatest teacher mm. because I would never ever allow anyone to speak to me the way my son speaks to me. And it's not about being, you know, not, not saying the right things. It, it's more about holding space for him to express himself. 
Mm -hmm. My husband would probably cut someone off and then impose his argument upon that person. And then he would say, I'm not interested to speak about this anymore and move back. He doesn't do this with our son. So, and he was describing like, he's talking, I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, how can I control my ego here? Because my ego wants to lash out. My ego wants to answer. My ego wants to win, but I don't want that. So he just pulled back and I'm like, what? He pulled back and he said, you know what? It's okay. Let's agree to disagree and it's okay. And then he just continued to do what he was doing, working out, coming home, being in a good mood without ruminating, without thinking. And he said, this is new to me. This is new to me that I can observe my own ego and say, no, I don't want that. I think that I chokes me up because <clears throat> the in Judaism, there's a thing called the Shema. It mm-hmm. is hero Israel, the Lord our God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And when Gregor says, my ego wants to win. Yes. But that's not what I want. Mm-hmm. The truth is, outside of our ego controlling us the i want is to be loved Mm -hmm. and to love that is the truth Mm -hmm. that is the truth of our existence that we are when we say made in the image of god we're made in love we are love this is Mm -hmm. love we are to remember and the ego wants to win but that's not what we really want what we want is for another to be loved for us to feel love to be source mm-hmm. of love. That is the ultimate soul truth on this plane of experience mm. is love. Yes. And that is the most beautiful thing that Gregor is seeing that. And, and I, that touches me and like, yeah, well, I want my children to be loved. I want to be loved. Don't we all yes. want to be loved, not be right? Mm-hmm. Who cares exactly. about being right? Oh my yeah. gosh. It's exhausting. It's a dumb yes. game. It's old. It's over it's ended but love yeah you want to be right because as a child you might not have been right because your parents think they they have to teach you something here Mm. they're not acknowledging that you're their teacher so you want to show that i do know things i come from a place of love and i know how it's supposed to be here but your parents have been here for a long time where love is secondary and everything else is primary and it's the other way around. Mm. And I've learned that from my son to know that I don't have to win. Why would I want to win over my own son? That's, mm. <laughs> that's insanity. In my world, it's insanity. <laughs> Why would I want to win over him? Do I, wa- I want us to have clarity. I want him to, to maybe see it the same way I see it, but win over him? Why would I want that? And it, it, it should actually be so with everyone, because if we all could feel safe when it comes to not being um, told what to think, being allowed to think what we think and not being ridiculed or diminished or, you know, scared of whatever it is, just allowing it to be there and lovingly looking at it we we might see that what we think is wrong and that's okay you can just back off but if we're not allowed that space what we do is we push instead harder Mm. push harder when we're not seen Mm. that's how we lock into a negative side of ego not being able to change Mm. so the more the more the push from the outside the more the less the love the more we will push back so as a parent, why would I want to create that kind of an environment? For me, I have to take the responsibility that I am the parent. And what do I want in this relationship? I want clarity. I want ease. I want love. I want understanding. Mm-hmm. And I want to be able to share opinions, even if they're not the same. That's the goal. And I have to go back, find that space and say, okay, we do not agree with each other, but there are other things that we agree upon or we don't need to agree. We love each other anyway. Yeah, that's right. We end every conversation with, 
I love you anyway. <laughs> I love you too. And the other day I had this beautiful thing because the programming within me is that I always have to fix stuff. If I say mm -hmm. what I think and I feel like I'm hurting someone, I want to fix it immediately. And with my son, it's like this. I went into his room and I said, I want to hug you. And he says, nope, you're not hugging me this time because you're hugging me from a place of guilt. You can't hug me while you're there. So I had to go outside and I'm thinking, okay, he's, that's true. I felt guilty because we had this argument. So I had to figure out how to put myself out of guilt. And that's easy. It's to say he loves me anyway. And I am present where I am right now. And then go back in and say, okay, no guilt. I just want to hug you because I like it. And that's when you gave me a hug. <laughs> oh, so, that's so good. To know where the frequency comes from. Yeah. That's the key thing. If there's nothing else you take away from this session here today, yeah. know where the frequency come from, yeah. comes from. Is it a place of fear or is it a place of genuine love or trust or understanding or compassion or whatever vibes positively within you right. and it's easy hmm. it's beautiful. It, beautiful yes again a, a, an hour went by so fast yes it did i i'm excited i'm glad we did this this one today mm -hmm. i feel like it's gonna it, just everyone just know that there is a framework that we can choose differently. And, and this is so beautiful. I just thank you. This is so yeah. good. I think that the next one, we could actually do something that is about practical stuff, how to, how yeah. to recognize and how to stop ego yes. from taking over some practical stuff that we could maybe share yeah. with them. I think that, that would be beautiful. beautiful. I yeah. agree. I agree. Yes. So next Sunday, everyone get ready for that. Yes. And thank you. Thanks for a great conversation. Thank 